Welcome back to another episode of the Loco Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Conlon, and this week I'm joined by Dr. Bill Campbell, my old grad school advisor, and I'm so excited to have you back on the show. This is your second or thir- third episode? At least. At least. Maybe four, maybe five? No, not that many. Are we going back to when we would record at, at USF? Once oh, well, all? that was like when I used to do the vlogs. Oh, okay. Back in the day. Well, oh, my god. It's gosh. all the same to me. I know, true. I... <laughs> I went back and looked at some of those. For anybody who's been around that long, you might remember. I used to do these just like vlog updates, which literally were me just sitting and talking, but I would also be like, you know, four weeks out. So I'm like half dead, you know, running the research project, dieting. And I'd be like, so today we did my body comp. But people like loved it because I've always just really shared like what we were doing. Yep. And um, we had access to a lot of cool things to really track stuff over the years. So if I ever do compete again, guess what you're getting roped into doing? Vlogs? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to do a vlog. <laughs> this is at least my third time here. Yes. And we're super excited to have you back. And today we're actually going to talk about the surgence of the weight loss drugs. And I'm really excited to talk about this because I've wanted to have a conversation about this, but I am not well-versed enough in the literature to have a scientific discussion about this. So I'm really, really pleased that you're here to talk about it because I do not think that this is going anywhere. I think when it did first come out, maybe people were like, oh, this would be a fad. But I really am now getting the sense this is no longer a fad, right? Would you agree? 100%. It will change our culture. They are. They have already. Interesting. That's a, that is a strong statement. And nope. I know you wouldn't just say that if you didn't actually mean that. Nope. I talk to a lot of people, fitness professionals that are working with clients. So yes, I have reasons for my, my thoughts on, mm-hmm. on this. So first, let's break down. I know there's a few, right? There's Ozempic is pretty much the, the most popular one in terms of like the name but they're all a similar class of drugs. So do you want to just give like a little bit of an overview sure. of that first? Yeah. So, and let me even back up a little bit more. I first started talking about this because I, I communicate with fitness professionals and I felt like fitness professionals and I myself early on were, were putting our heads in the sand like, oh, this is go away because it's, it's a threat. If you're a weight loss coach, and your whole job is to help people lose weight with exercise and nutrition, counseling, and these drugs come in, or these, anti, these medications, the medical profession would like us to refer to them as anti-obesity medications. So just, if, just to put that out there. For what that's worth. <laughs> yes. And I wanted to do my role as, a, as an educator to say, hey, fitness professionals, let's not put our heads in the sand. It's not, they're not going away. And let's look at, yeah, let's, let's acknowledge the threats, but let, let's also appreciate a lot of opportunities that they're going to give. So if you want to go there later, I'm happy to do that. Absolutely. But the, the class of medications are known as GLP-1 agonists. I'm going to keep saying GLP-1, but GLP-1 is an acronym for glucagon-like peptide 1. So you mentioned Ozempic. Ozempic is the most popular brand of these medications that was not approved for weight loss and is not approved for weight loss. It's approved for diabetes. These were initially diabetes drugs that also happened to cause a lot of significant weight loss. The same company, Norvo Nordisk, approved, they did get approval for the same medication, the same compound for weight loss. That's called Wegovy. Um, the way that I remember that is Wegovy starts with a W, so does weight loss, but everybody calls it Ozempic. And there's second generation, there's other brands, but my the reading that I've mostly been focused on is on semaglutide, Ozempic, Wegovy. So when I'm talking about these, I'm referring to the research that I've read on that particular compound. So semaglutide is what a lot of people will call this as well. So... There's the the naming part of this. What is a GLP-1 agonist? So GLP-1 by itself is just a hormone. Our bodies make it. When you eat, you eat food, let's just say carbs, your body will release GLP-1, and it's released in the gut, possibly in the central nervous system as well. But we know for sure in the gut, 
And what it does is basically two areas of action. The first is in the gut. So I'm going to explain three things that it does, and then you'll realize, oh, anti-diabetes medication, it makes sense. So it actually stimulates insulin from the pancreas. So what does that do to blood glucose? Lowers blood glucose. It also will block the release of glucagon. What does glucagon do? Glucagon will increase blood glucose. So from the liver, even from skeletal muscle. So we've just done two things to lower blood glucose. Insulin will lower blood glucose. So will stopping or blocking glucagon. The other thing that it does at the level of the gut is it slows down gastric motility. So food will go through your stomach at a given rate. This slows it down. When you slow down the rate that food moves through your stomach and then as it empties into your small intestine, guess what that does to blood glucose levels? Keeps them lower. So everything about this drug locally to the GI tract or to the gut is lowering blood glucose. Hence, the effectiveness of this medication as an anti-diabetes medication. Then, as I'm reading this, I have the question everybody else asks, well, why, do, why can't we just take GLP-1? Like, why do we need to produce a, a, a compound called semaglutide? The reason is the half-life. So the half-life in our bodies is about a couple seconds at most. The half-life of this GLP-1 agonist, which is very similar in structure to the natural hormone we produced, it's so similar that it binds to the same receptors. That means that's the agonist part of this, but it lasts for days and days. So that's why we have weekly injections of Ozempic and Wegovy. The half-life is lasting days, not seconds. Something else we've realized with these medications, this is, the, this is where the gold is. They act on your brain, and essentially it suppresses appetite, unlike nothing we have ever seen before. So there is some benefits locally in the, in the gut, but I, if I were just to throw out my estimation, 95% of the effective action of these medications is acting on the brain and suppressing appetite to the extent that food is just removed from your life. And I'm a foodie. I'm an obese person in a not quite obese body. I think about food all the time. I can appreciate, (laughs) you you probably knew that, you remember that about me. I can sympathize with, man, it would be nice to wake up and maybe go to bed without being focused on what am I going to eat next? What do I have to prepare next? What do I have to avoid next? Absolutely. That's a really, really good overview because I think a lot of people hear this. I mean, it's it's in like everyday kind of culture now, right? Like Ozempic, Ozempic, Ozempic. But what does that mean? And, you know, for a long time, metformin has been out for, of course, you know, diabetes and just kind of any insulin related issues, right? Obviously, there is some research for cancer prevention, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of people who are diabetic will take metformin. And they will have, you know, some success. Some people have terrible GI issues with it, so they cannot continue it. Um, I don't know if that is a common side effect with semaglutide also. Oh, yeah. Side effects are are, are what make this medication controversial. So that's so interesting because, and they work in different mechanisms, to my understanding, of metformin versus versus this, but I know one of the things, again, with metformin, why a lot of people can't stay on it is because of the, well, they don't want to stay on it is because of the GI upset. Um, but to my knowledge, there is none of the appetite suppression or regulation from that. Um, and, you know, obviously anybody who's dealt with, like you said, a lot of cravings, a lot of hunger, a lot of food obsessions, to be free from that would be so exciting, right? However... There's always a catch, right? Like the the thing about this is as soon as I started hearing more about this, I was like, okay, there's obviously something that isn't isn't great about this. Like, w- what is it? So I didn't know there was any GI issues. So let's That's talk about that. That's the most common side. Should okay. we go there now? Yeah. So most common side effect, GI issues, constipation, vomiting, nausea, and then more severe would be pancreatitis. Mm-hmm. stomach paralysis. These are in the more severe. Mm-hmm. I, I need to say that not not every person has these side effects. Mm-hmm. Some people do. When, when I read the research studies, it seems like it's in about a third of the people are reporting 
some form of GI side effect. You go to the internet, you think everybody's having the most severe side effects, but the research doesn't doesn't support that. Now, in my world, and I'll say your world, we're in fitness, lifting weights. Two studies, the only two studies that have looked at lean body mass, you are actually losing more lean tissue with these medications than what you would compared to just dieting. That may be artifact. I don't know. I do hear that a lot um, from, from, again, the fitness coaches that I communicate with in their patients. So those are the main side effects. Mm -hmm. GI distress and a loss of lean, more lean tissue than what you would anticipate. Yeah, that's always been my concern as soon as I read anything about that, right? Was, okay, this seems too good to be true. Where is the problem? And some people will for lack of a better term, stomach GI issues, because they're like, all right, well, the, the pros outweigh this, right? But when we are talking about loss of lean body mass, which if we're talking about a healthy person who is training substantially, right? Like resistance training four to five times a week, eating enough protein, um, and maybe they incorporate Ozempic, could that be different? Certainly. But What's happening, and what I would imagine, is that people who are struggling with their weight, who do not have a lot of lean tissue to start, and they have a lot of body fat, they're being put on this, and yes, they're losing body fat, but they have not changed any of their habits because their appetite is so suppressed that they really can't get any food down, or very minimal, especially around the days that they're taking the shot. Um, but then they're obliterating the little bit of lean body mass that they had, which we know after after a diet, all of those effects are completely magnified from the lack of lean tissue. And a lot of metabolic adaptations persist until lean tissue is restored. So one of the things that I've been talking about forever and ever and ever, as you know, about weight regain and how important it, like that whole part of the process is, is because there's you know physiological and psychological things that are happening after a diet and my concern with this is that all of those are just being magnified times 100 with this product. Do you think that I may be overreacting? Or what are your thoughts when you hear all that? Like, let's take, again, not, not someone who's training, eating enough protein, all that. Like, let's take someone who never resistance trained or, you know, very minimally active and eats 50 grams of protein a day. And they're put on this. So th this is where, as I've been studying this, I've had to kind of, I'll say, check my biases. So mm -hmm. what is my bias? I was trained as an exercise and nutrition researcher practitioner. Mm -hmm. So that is how I view the world. If you want to lose body fat, you do that through food, food selection and exercise. I've had to understand or force myself to say or appreciate these medications while it wouldn't be the method that I would first choose for a lot of people because there is no lifestyle change. And again, that can get into the opportunity part of this later. You kind of have to balance excess adiposity. How harmful is that versus how harmful is losing some extra lean tissue? And again, not everybody does. How harmful are these side effects that not everybody has, but even if they do experience them, what's the trade-off? I believe that excess adiposity is very harmful. So it's not just, you can't just focus on the side effects and all these negatives because you have to balance that with this loss of excess adiposity. No, I love that perspective. And I think that it's so, it's so important for us to always check our biases, right? Because we get so used to seeing similar types of people and then we start to view the world just through that lens, right? And I do agree that excess adiposity is a huge problem just in terms of inflammation and all the downstream effects and the things that, you know, the other diseases that this causes, right, metabolically speaking. So I do agree that that could be a, a potential trade-off that maybe this is better, right? Like they already had low lean body mass. Well, what's losing some more? Um, I guess my concern is always just like the after because I'm always thinking about, you know, I just know how the traditional medical system works where it's like, here, be put on this. And then there's no other interventions afterwards. There's no discussion. There is no help. There's no tapering. There's no, there's, you know, what if you run out of your medication? What if you can't get in and get another script? What's going to happen then? Like, there's just all these things that unfortunately, the way that a lot of these systems work are not really set up, in my opinion, to help people in the long term. 
Do, have you heard about the shortages of these medications? No. So this is troubling. Okay. There is an FDA acknowledged shortage, one, and the shortage is so severe that people who have been prescribed Ozempic for di- for their diabetes cannot get these medications. There is such a shortage. Just this week, I read multiple reports of counterfeit Ozempic flooding not just United States, countries in Europe. So counterfeit GLP-1 agonists flooding the market, a shortage, which is why you're starting to see a lot more compounding pharmacies making this off, you know, that that's not coming from the actual patent holders. Yeah, so the shortage is a real issue. And what we have is a lot of what we would call vanity use. So you have Hollywood people, you have people with money that are buying this that have no right to buy this whatsoever. Um, if you followed me on Instagram, Bill Campbell, PhD, Lauren, you would know about... I do follow you. Oh. I just haven't checked. <laughs> you, well, if you check I did, I that didn't like, day. I didn't like unfollow you. <laughs> <laughs> but about two... Going into the holidays, I went to my local um, my local mall, Wiregrass Mall, outdoor mall. Love going there. Been going there for my entire children's lives. I see this weight loss center or spa or something. I'm like, oh, I'm going to see what they... I could have walked out of there with Ozempic that night. Could have it, it? It was a they were giving. I would. I'm going to say they're giving away Ozempic. And then you know I talk about this and I have people communi- not calling me but communicating from all over the country. They're on every block. This one lady I talked to in Utah, Salt Lake City. They're on every block, every billboard. It is. This is everywhere, and people that are not obese are wanting and getting these medications. So I guess I don't understand what the shortage would be. Like, is the shortage happening because these clinics are buying them? I, how, because they're they're there. So you're saying like there's, I guess I just don't understand how there would be a shortage. I, I think the shortage is the, 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 the medication manufacturers are not able to literally make enough to meet the demand for the legitimate use. And now you add in all of the vanity use of the medication okay. that's making it worse. And again, I know people in my family that have close friends who, with diabetes, they can't get the drug that they've been getting for the last few years because of the shortage. But they could go to a clinic and get it? Maybe like the clinic bought it up? Like that's what I'm, that's what I'm confused about, I guess. Yeah, well, and I think that I, I, this is where I'm speaking with um, some ignorance. I think these clinics are compounding it. So they're making it oh, technically understood. off- I don't want to say off label. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a pharmacist. This is not my area. But compounding pharmacies, because there's an FDA acknowledged or stated shortage, they allow compound pharmacies to make Got these it. to help meet the shortage of demand. And again, I, I don't know, but I imagine, well, that has to make the the patent holders probably frustrated because they invested whatever millions oh, of dollars. Well, yeah, and now you- now everybody's making it in their compounding pharmacy. Again, I have a lot more to learn there. Probably never will because it's I don't need to know that. Yeah. But oh, I'm, well, there's got to, you know, when anything, with anything where there's that much money involved, especially with pharma, they will get their pay like somehow. <laughs> so I am not even worried about them. But it's very unfortunate, like you said, that people who actually need it are really struggling now. And, you know, you even just said something that was so minor, but you know, people that your family knows who have been taking this for years. Like, I didn't... I, I wasn't, for diabetes. Yeah, I wasn't even aware, though, that this had been around for years. Like, that's how ignorant I've been to this because I think, to your point, that really just highlights how much it's blown up in the past year, maybe, I One guess? or two years, yeah. yeah. Where it's no. been like, oh, what's this thing? Okay, okay. And then, like you said, a lot of the fitness professionals kind of, like, push it away or we just think, oh, this is another fad, this is another thing because... There have been a lot of concerted efforts over the years to create sustainable weight loss drugs. Well, I, w- I wouldn't say this is sustainable, but you know, create weight loss drugs that actually work, right? Um, what was the one? Oh my gosh, that basically would just make you like have they all then? Well, no, that was like an amphetamine, but um, well, those work, but <laughs> put holes in your heart. Um, minor, minor issue. Um, no, so not just the stimulants. What was the one? Was it called like Ali or Ali or Orlistat? Orlistat. That's still, that's still, but like that, I mean, that 
helped but wasn't like it didn't take off like this right and then obviously a lot of people they tried so hard with you know to manufacture like stuff for lep to regulate leptin which we thought like would be the key to all of this but it obviously didn't work out in terms of bioavailability and it was so expensive etc etc so really and you know metformin showed some promise in terms of you know diabetes and you know insulin management but nothing I think has worked up until now this well. Cause even like, even the stimulants, they work, but I don't think they, stimulants drop your appetite, but I don't, th- I, I mean, not to this degree. I've taken plenty of stimulants in my life and um, like, it's not like, yes, you, it does kind of silence that, but then there's all these like kind of other things that are going on too. Like you can't really function totally normally if you're just slamming amphetamines all the time. Then yes. you start to have some other downstream really negative effects, of course. Um, maybe you're not eating, but you're also not doing a lot of other things <laughs> or taking care of yourself. So um, I don't think that there has been anything that so holistically outside of the loss of lean tissue, outside of some, you know, maybe GI or pancreatic issue. Do you think that that happens? Are people maybe... Um, taking like more than they should like is that like a thing that people would do or do you think it's just really like because you said some of it's in the literature that they've shown you know okay they have these issues but i'm just thinking if somebody's like oh a little bit's good i'll take more and then maybe are those people who are getting the pancreatitis the the pancreatitis or is it just like no some people end up getting these issues yeah so the pancreatitis affects I've not seen that in the research literature. That's oh. that's anecdotal. Okay, so I wonder if that's people just that, that taking. Could be. But more. my my impression is the the medication is so effective you don't need to have higher dosages. Just as an example, mm. a little funny story. Just culturally, I, I read this again just yesterday. Walmart has been doing internal research on shopping carts and shopping baskets about how the weight of them has been going down for the last few months, last year. And they've been able to categorize Ozempic users and non-users. So even these large food-based retail stores are seeing this in their in their groceries. Like their, How do they measure a, a, they, a The card? only thing that makes sense, and again, they didn't get into the, the only thing that makes sense is they, at some, some stores, they have a scale where they're getting one out of every eight people, 10 people that go through, and they've noticed the average weight of the carts wow. has gone down, or shopping baskets. And then again, I don't know, but I'm assuming, hey, would you be willing to take this eight-minute survey? And yeah. then you're, you know, then because then they're divulging what, what they're taking. So it, it's, again, when I say this is changing culture, it is changing culture. The other interesting aspect of this which i think you'll appreciate because you're you're you you appreciate the psychology more you're giving somebody a medication that is taking away their hunger now as much as i have a a kind of a i'll just say right now i hate relationship with my hunger i'm hungry right now i'm looking forward to what i'm going to eat tonight when we're done here (laughs) people get joy from eating they 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 revolve social events holidays And some of the stories that I've heard is you're taking away any drive to eat whatsoever. And that, in turn, is impacting the social interactions. So I believe these behavioral psychologists, food researchers, food behavioral researchers, are going to start studying what is the impact of this on a a interpersonal level. And... Let me just say, when I say the appetites are being suppressed, people are not eating. They're having to set an alarm, eat every four hours, get protein, which if you think about it, that's probably why they're losing lean mass. They're just not eating, and that probably also explains the low energy. For sure. Like, that's one of the biggest issues is most people... Most people struggle, not on Ozevic, to eat enough protein, right? Like, it's, it's a challenge for almost everybody outside of a select very very small percentage of people um so you already take someone who probably isn't like if i got on ozempic it would probably be hard for me to eat protein even though i've done this for my whole life right um so take someone who hasn't already had that they're already used to not really eating a lot so now they're just like oh well it's whatever and we all know when we're not hungry the last thing that we want to do is like oh let me have a you know (laughs) eight ounces of chicken and be like fuck, no that's the last thing i want you know um so it's probably also to your point um, 
you know, people who are really struggling with their appetite are are self-selecting to not have any or having minimal protein. Have you seen anything where over time this like gets better? Um, Because I also know that people can't or shouldn't stay on this forever. But then you just said that your family friends have been on this for years. For diabetes. For diabetes. Okay. So um, does that like resolve? And of course, there's going to be variation, right? Like some people have probably have on a scale of one to 10, zero hunger or negative five hunger. Some people are still going to probably have like a five because some people maybe started at like a 10, right? Yeah. So they're probably still going to have some hunger cues. So there is going to be variation there. But is there anything to show that that kind of stabilizes over time? Or is it just kind of like a consistent, just nothing? So speaking to the research on this, only yeah. one study that I'm aware of, and I'm, I'm reviewing this in my research review for February, because I get asked this a lot, like, what happens when you stop taking it? Do you have to stay on this forever? The one study that looked at this when they had them on it for several months and then they said, we're going to either give you the same dosage of the medication or a placebo, the group that they switched to placebo gained their weight back. Mm -hmm. So the answer is there is no end to this. You're on it. And if you want to maintain your weight loss, you stay on it. No, I meant end to the hunger suppression. Like, does that ever regulate oh. back to some kind of a baseline? Or, hey, I took this for five years and I'm still completely hunger squashed. Like, I mean, at what point? Yeah, that that I don't know. I'm not aware of um, any trials that have been that long. Probably but I not. would still go back to that, that study. When you're off the drug, your appetite comes back. And mm-hmm. Now you're hungry and you're going to eat more. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, like long-term use, what that would potentially cause. Because, you know, then then we're talking about, you know, micronutrient and protein deficiencies. If someone is on this for several years and they're eating, you know, again, 30, 40, 50 grams of protein, they're not getting any micronutrients in, that's also going to create some issues. You know, like, yeah, maybe now their diabetes is under control, um, but we have you know, a larger issue to face now. So, or a new problem that we get. Yeah, new, new problem. <laughs> um, well, they're going to make a drug for that. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure that'll be something. <laughs> um, just like, a, you know, when you get like the IV drips with, uh, you might just get like an IV drip of protein. Wouldn't that be crazy if you could just sit there and be like, I don't want to eat, just give me 200 grams of protein <laughs> um, and let that be synthesized. Uh, that paper did just come out too. Um, the, 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 pro, the hundred gram mm-hmm. I'm doing that. That that's, that's the other article I'm okay. doing. And I was <laughs> like, February. I was like that better be in there because that was a, that was, I didn't even read the whole thing, but well, that I changes thought. a lot of, um, a, a lot of the earlier research when they looked at cellular responses to protein mm-hmm. titration. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's super. I mean, and that's the thing about research is that there's always things that are updated. I think people get so hung up with science sometimes with like, Oh, see science, scientists are always changing their mind. It's like, First of all, things get updated. We learn new things. There's new techniques, right? Like things have to be changed. I'm actually listening to this book right now, the one I told you about, Mastery um, by Robert Greene. So good. Anybody who's listening, um, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, Robert Greene is a phenomenal author. Um, I'm actually listening on audiobook, which I normally don't do, but I was like, I walk a lot. I'm like, I just... I need to be using my time wisely. Um, so anyways, if you have Spotify premium, this is actually included. I want to tell everybody and their mother this. Like literally I'm telling everybody, if you have Spotify premium, download these audiobooks. Um, so anyways, he, he, what Robert Green does in a lot of his books that I've gone through so far is he will use like historical figures or situations to then of course, like he goes through their story, but like in a really unique way and then shares, you know, kind of the lesson through all that. Um, and it just, it, it ties the story better together. Right. Um, but they were talking about a, like literally, what was it called? It was basically when like women started going to physicians and then they would like have their babies and then a huge percentage of them would die because the, the doctors weren't washing their hands. So the women would all develop this infection and they were like, well, why are women who are having babies at home not dying from this? And then people who are coming here. And then the guy basically figured out that, hey, if we just wash our hands, it was like this whole thing. But then um, the reason I bring that up is because like he was challenging, of course, what had been known for all of these years and everybody thought he was just this radical person. And it's so crazy to think about it now. Like, oh my gosh, of course, like we could never even imagine. But at the time he was a nut. Yeah, Yeah, at the time. And then he was kind of a dick too. So then nobody believed him. But 
you gotta listen, you gotta listen or read the book to find out the whole story. But, um, you know, things change, right? And then that's, especially like with this stuff, right? Like, okay, now there's probably gonna be, how many people are gonna be now researching in the next five, 10 years the impact of Ozempic? I mean, so many labs are probably going to be focusing on this. Um, for good reason, like all the, and like I'm sure there's gonna be a ton of like NIH funded stuff coming out from this. And to your point, a lot of the food behavior related things, because that's going to be really big. And if people are using this for, you know, we're saying vanity reasons for physique related reasons, not just diabetic reasons, if they do come off, I think that that is where there is a big opportunity in the fitness space. Um, but I definitely want to hear your thoughts on kind of where you see the opportunities here with, you know, people who are either coaches or just kind of practitioners in our space. Yeah. So the first one is a little bit more retrospective on, on, from, from my thinking of this again, forcing myself to step outside of my exercise and nutrition box. I don't want to live in a sick country. I think you would agree. Our country is sick. Um, just with the obesity pandemic. I mean, it's, it's bad. People can't fit in um, airplane seats. They are having low testosterone um, as, in, as you know, men, erectile dysfunction. So infertility, tons yes. of metabolic diseases. I mean, literally everything, so many things stem from high body fat. And this is not a physique related issue. This is simply an inflammatory issue and all the downstream things that this can cause, like cancers, huge. Yep. And think of, and this is what, you know, I, it makes me sad, you, and then you have childhood obesity. How, what's the, what would be worse than that? The, all the social pressures and trying to fit in, going to an amusement park, like just the things you can't do. And the, just the, the comments from other children, again, horrible. Everything about it's horrible. So... If you were to present to me, hey, we've developed something that can reduce this by 50% in my country. And yes, there's some side effects, but overall, we can, we can really put a huge dent in this obesity pandemic. I, 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 again, at, at my face value, I think that's a good thing. For fitness professionals in particular... I, I think the opportunity is, we can, well, the, the, the threat is they don't need us for weight loss. Um, now, for those of us that are in bodybuilding physique enhancement, which is kind of, kind of, kind of my niche, I don't think this is going to impact that much. I mean, maybe there's an Ozempic division in the, <laughs> in, the, in the NPC next year. I don't, other than that, I don't think bodybuilding is going to be impacted as much because they're going to still people are going to still want training accountability etc but for the general population fitness professional i think what's going to happen is right now you have a given population of people that may want your services but we're going to have a huge influx of new people that previously were never in our network or our reach because they're not going to a gym. They can't fit in the machines to, to, do a, to do a shoulder press. Or they're too worried about what people may think. So if we have hundreds of thousands of people that have lost a lot of weight, now the idea of, I might want to get fit now. I, I can fit in. I can do this. I can walk on a treadmill. So I, I'm even telling people that, that I communicate with. If I'm a fitness professional, I start offering Ozempic programs for people. Are you on Ozempic? This is a program for you. And that program would be timing your food, making sure you're getting enough protein, enough, you know, enough, um, enough calories, um, maybe, you know, introductory workouts. Again, it doesn't have to be anything different, but you're marketing it to people. I'm currently helping a female who doesn't, as a last resort, she doesn't want to take these medications. She she's obese. She goes, "Hey, I will go on it if I need to. I just I just don't want to do that. I feel like I if I have some accountability. So that's all I'm doing. I'm just providing an accountability partner to her. There's those people, the people that don't ever want to take these, that are willing to try one last time 
to lose body weight. So th- th- that's my, those are my thoughts around the, the, the opportunity mm-hmm. aspect of this. No, and I love that. And it's really hopeful and it's really positive because I feel like every conversation I've heard around this is just like so negative um, or it's so delusional, right? Like it's not, it's not um, taking into consideration some of the potential issues, right? And really understanding like what is actually happening here on a mechanistic level. How is this going to impact people in the future? And I do think that it's a great idea, especially because again, this is something that is, is definitely here to stay and can have a lot of positive impacts. However, I do think that there still needs to be an effort put in towards like building the right habits and building the right lifestyle. Like that does not get to get circumvented because of this. And to your point, I think it could be that like launch pad for a lot of people, right? It could be that thing where they're like, you know, finally now they've lost, you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds. And then they're like, man, maybe now I want to actually, like you said, go to the gym, start training, get more fit. Um, but that can also happen in conjunction, right? And I mm-hmm. also think that there's a space for coaches who, you know, if people have been taking these and now want to either taper off or, or come off of them because they maybe have gotten to the physique space that they, they, they want or they've achieved their fat loss um, or, or rather their weight loss. Okay, now what? right? Like how, how can we now build this up? So ideally it would probably be simultaneously, but you could also, you know, create programs for, you know, post Ozempic life. You know what I mean? Like let's actually maintain this because that's going to be huge too. Like it's not just, as we know, it's not just the loss, it's the maintenance. And that is what is hard for every single person. I don't care who you are, how long you've been doing this. It is much harder afterwards to navigate all of those things. It's really exciting to like have a goal, start chipping towards it. You know, you feel good. You're making changes. Um, but it's a lot harder to keep yourself in check when things are more boring, <laughs> especially afterwards. But I love what you were saying about that. And I really think that that kind of gives, hopefully everybody's listening to more hopeful view of this. Um, and a little bit less of like a, um, just like less negativity around it. Cause I feel like there's a lot of negativity around it. And to be honest, like I, I didn't know enough, you know, I knew, I knew some things, um, but this was very enlightening. So I really hope that everybody got a lot out of this. Um, and you will be talking about this in this month or February's. Um, yeah. What happens when you stop taking these medications? Yeah. And that's going to be in body by science, which is your research review, mm-hmm. which is awesome. It's super unique because there's two studies a month um, that you review, but then there's also um, coaches in the space who also give their thoughts on the article. So it's very practical. Um, yeah. How do, how do you up like, as you were, and you're one of my experts, how do you apply it mm-hmm. now for these, these medications? I have physicians, like I had mm-hmm. Spencer, Gabrielle, I have two other physicians this month giving us, Hey, what are you seeing as a mm-hmm. healthcare professional prescribing these medications? Mm-hmm. That'll be awesome. I'm super excited to read that. And before we close off this episode, which is unrelated, but (laughs) exciting in the lab, um, I did want to touch on the research that you guys are wrapping up right now in the lab. So give a little insight into the reverse dieting study. So we're we're just formulating. Yes, yes. We're on the front end of planning this. So (laughs) this is, I know you would like it because even from when you were just starting your scientific studies journey you're all about weight maintenance mm-hmm. let's we have to, we have to see what happens after the diet ends i'm like no that's boring just let's just diet and study that nope but my team and I, <laughs> and what i love about this is my my research team about 20 undergraduate and graduate students they are 100% in charge of responsible for designing this study so the question is what do we do when the diet is over? That's like the, the question. And what they have what they've done is they said, okay, we're going to have three groups of people, so we're going to diet people. By the way, this will be a virtual study, so we're going to open this up to the world, essentially, males, females. Um, I don't, we don't have all the details yet, but you have to be resistance training, and you're going to have to go on a diet. And then when the diet's over... You were going to either have you increase your calories gradually, we're going to calculate your new maintenance calories, and we're going to put you at that level, which will be a little bit more of an abrupt increase initially, or we're just going to say, do whatever you want. Like, we're not going to give you any instruction, and we're going to follow them for, you know, at least like 15, 16 weeks to see 
is there a better approach? So essentially, we're borrowing from bodybuilders, bodybuilding coaches that use reverse dieting, and we're bringing it to a little bit more of a general fit population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a true intervention. So like when we did my study, I didn't... I purposefully didn't want to do anything afterwards, right? I just wanted to see, did how you diet affect the post-diet period? Um, but this is different, of course, looking at all the different applications, what we can do. And I love this intervention and I'm so excited. And how are you guys going to, is this going to be like through the scales? Because I remember there was like a scale you were testing for a while to see like how accurate it was. Yeah. So I, I, I tested four scales against the four compartment model. Um, what we're going to do is just say, hey, use your own personal bathroom scale, and that's going to be the the only requirement. We are then going to ask, if you can and you're willing, please go out and get a validated body composition measure. So do you have access to a bod pod dexa in body, something like that? So what we think we'll have there is a subset of, the, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully maybe half or a third. So... Again, that we can't make everybody get body composition tests, but for those that are willing and able, we're going to have, we believe, because we're going to recruit 300, 400 people for this, we're going to have enough of a sample size to, to be able to make meaningful um, estimations on body fat. And Dr. Eric Trexler is our data analyst for this, so nice. that's why I can confidently say we, 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 can, we can do a lot of things on the data analysis side of things with, with, his, with his involvement. Yeah, he's really good at all that. And that's, you know, there's always trade-offs, right, with, of course, if you do an in-house study, you can look at all of those things yourself. But then there's, you know, 20, maybe 30 people in a study, right? Yes. Um, and that's, that's like, that's a lot. Like, people don't realize how much, like, a 30-person study is, is like a lot in our field um, when we're measuring all the things that we do. So, of course, the trade-off is, okay, yeah, we only get body weight, potentially, but you're also now getting a much larger subset. So hopefully we can actually see some more of those trends. And I'm super excited for all of this when you guys do finally like, you know, get all the methods together and and get this started. So we'll definitely share when that's open because one of the other problems with research, you know, not a problem, but it's just a reality is that if it is at a certain, you know, location, then, you know, you want like, hey, I want to tell people about it, but they live across the country, you know what I mean? So they can't do it. So a lot more people can participate in this. Yes. Um, so tentatively, when do you think this is going to be open for recruitment? We hope to submit the IRB application by the end of January. So let's say that's four weeks. So I'm thinking early March is when okay. we will launch this study. Nice. So we will definitely let you guys know. Dr. Campbell will put that on his social. I will jump back on social just to share it. <laughs> so I'll, follow, I'll follow you again. Um, so let everybody know where they can follow you because you do put out a lot of really great stuff and then also the link or the website for Body by Science. Okay. Yeah. So to follow me, Instagram is the only place. That's Bill Campbell PhD. And then my website, if you want to look at the research review, I, 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 I'm giving away like the the highlights of the first year, it's like 99 pages. Just go to BillCampbellPhD.com. Nice. Well, we will put that in the show notes as well. But thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. And part of what I wanted to do this year was really make the show more interactive with you guys' questions um, or situations or scenarios that you want to send in. So if you go to this episode show notes, you will also see an anonymous Google form that you can fill out any topics or questions you have for us. And for any questions about coaching, consulting, or mentorship, you can visit teamlocofit.com and we will talk to you guys next week.